lightning talks. Do you remember how lightning talks work? Who needs a refresher? Great, lightning talks are five minutes. Five minutes of lightning talks. There is a timer down here that will count down when the timer starts. When there are 10 seconds remaining, the gong person, who is our gong person? Lacey will be my wonderful demonstrator. The gong will start slowly making sound until right when it goes three, two, one. And then we all start clapping and then they have to stop talking because they can't hear themselves think and then we change over and then all the laptops will definitely work and everything will be great. I'm not sure that I have anything to add. I'm gonna you go summed it up. You talk for a bit, I'm gonna check. Okay, so I prepared a little activity for, um, for between these sessions here. I am not nearly as good a storyteller as Russell is. I don't really have stories. I like to play games. Um, has anyone ever played the game Never Have I Ever? Okay, so if you haven't played the game, the way that it works is that I'll say, never have I ever done a particular thing, and if you have done that thing, you raise your hand. So if I were to say, never have I ever been to DjangoCon, what would all of you do? Yes, everyone's hand should be up because we're at DjangoCon right now. Now this is never have I ever programmer edition, so let's, let's start. Never have I ever crashed a client's website. I've done that. Keep your hand up if you've done that for more than an hour. What about more than a day? <laughs> yeah, sometimes we've had some kind of a bad day, um, bad days here, so that's fun. Never have I ever taken a video chat with a client or my boss while wearing pajamas. That's definitely me. I remote, I work from home. I know we had a talk about that today, so pajamas are a big part of that. Um, we ready? Not quite, we're blinking, okay. Um, never have I ever gotten myself caught in an infinite loop. Infinite loops are fun, yeah, and I, I feel like this is a really reassuring game because I think we've all made kind of a lot of the same mistakes. Um, all right, never have I ever spent more than an hour debugging something when all I needed to do was restart my server. <laughs> yeah, that's like literally everyone in this room, right? Yeah, we have, we have all been there, <laughs> yes. And it's so annoying too, right? Because finally you're like, all right, I'm just gonna turn it off and on again. I swear I've done this before, and then suddenly it works just fine, and it just sucks. All right. Never have I ever forgotten to update to master before I submitted my pull request and gotten caught in merge conflict hell. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Gets hard. Gets hard. We're still blinking. Never okay. have I ever made a projector work first time. Oh, gosh, yeah. Oof. Lies. I know. We have, we have a few liars here. Yeah. All right. Never have I ever committed my secret key to GitHub <laughs> in a public repo. <laughs> Then you get to learn how to change your secret key. It's, it's really a learning experience for everybody. It's awesome. Um, are we here? Almost. OK. Um, doo -doo -doo -doo. Never have I ever been able to say words, and they immediately appear on the screen in front of me. <laughs> Woo! This Woo! is magic. Well, first up, we have one of our wonderful stenographers, Cheryl, who is going to share with us her magic piano. Woo! I never realized how short I was until I stood by here. Um, first of all, I'd just like to say thanks to DVO who sponsored us to come, and it's an absolute privilege, and this is my fourth year, and uh, it's just been great to come, so. Right, we'll start with the introductions. So I'm Cheryl, and I'm from Wales. And for today, my colleague captioner, Andrew, will be my Siri. Andrew, would you like to introduce yourself? Thank you, Andrew. This is why your captions are delivered by humans. Okay, Andrew, can you really introduce yourself? <laughs> OK, 
Okay, I'll tell you more about Steno. So we type on shorthand machines, which have been for around for about 100 years now. So they originally, they, were, they weren't electric. It was uh, very much like your QWERTY typewriter. Uh, and then they slowly evolved to the machines that we have now. So that's the machine we type on. So it's been um, evolved over time, and so now it's connected to computers and allows us to provide these subtitles. So you play it like a piano, so you press chords of letters all at the same time, and then they come up into the words. So typically, as I know a lot of you are fascinated by numbers, I thought we'd let you know how many words are spoken on an average day at DjangoCon. Andrew, can you tell us the totals for Wednesday at DjangoCon, please? And that would take you about seven hours. OK, can you give me the figures for today, Siri? <laughs> Isn't karma sweet? <laughs> so, I'll tell you about the software and how it works. So you can see on the screen here, this is modern stenographic software. And you see, if you see the bar on the left contains the letters that Andrew is pressing. Sorry, on the right. So on, yes, on the right is because I'm backwards. OK, on the right is the note bar. And as Andrew presses the letters, you can see the letters popping up there. And so what it does, it puts the words up, and it does this by searching the database dictionary for the longest match of the group of letters, and prints it to the screen, and then adds the space ready for the next word. This process happens in the space of one second before the translation of the outline is thrown to screen. So Andrew will input a word, and within a second, it's thrown to the plasma screens on the left and right of the stage. So if you look at the main screen, and then look at the plasmas and see the connection. So how fast do people talk? Traditional speed is anything from 180 words a minute up to and in excess of 250 words a minute, ranging far beyond 300 words a minute on occasion. <laughs> I'm saying nothing. So, for us working as captioners, our preference is that the best talks are always from those speakers whose delivery is steady and not at jet engine pace. With thinking time, less is definitely more. So we experience lots of different words. We experience philosophers' names, Latin words, Greek words, double underscores, which reminds me, any chance of taking the double underscores out of Django codebase? <laughs> would make our lives so much easier. Thank you. Thank you so much, Cheryl and Andrew. It's so nice to have a peek behind the curtain. That was so cool. Oh, but am I allowed it? Am I allowed to carry on just a minute or two? Would that be all right or not? What do you reckon? I kind of feel like she's worked really, really hard okay, this week. Okay, okay, we will make okay. an exception. We will make a 60-second exception. Thank you. Right, OK. <laughs> so we experience foreign languages such, such as German and Greek, as I've already stated. So we also have Welsh. <laughs> so how do we cope with that? Prynhauden Darbaub, Sitoiti, Kreisoi Heidelberg. Now. <laughs> as you will see, Andrew's Welsh is about as good as my Scottish Gaelic. So you'll note that the email went out to speakers before the conference to ask for a preview of presentations and speaker notes. So I've primed Andrew with the Welsh. Should we try it again? 
Prynhawn Darbaw, which is good afternoon. Sit oi tea, how are you? Croesoi Heidelberg, welcome to Heidelberg. So for us as captioners, the pre-information makes our lives a whole lot easier. It enables us to be accurate and not to make rude mistakes. We're a human after all. All right, I think we're going to take a break from Never Have I Ever, and Katie's going to tell us a story. I have a story. Yes, it's have story you, time. Oh, we don't have the stenographer up anymore. Okay, I'm going to make sure I can see it because this is a good one. Um, have you heard the one about the monk? It's this old monk. He's, he's trying magic and stuff, but, you know, as monks do, he's up in his monastery. He doesn't have any shoes. He, he needs to brush his teeth, you know, a little bit. You know, he's the super calloused, fragile, mystic hex with halitosis. <laughs> I got a lowercase applause, not an uppercase applause. I don't know what to tell you about that. It does look like we're just about ready, though. This is like the, the fastest um, setup that we've ever had. I'm sorry that you're, you know. It was, it was the fastest Shaggy Dog story. It's fine. That's true. That's yeah. true. So, up All right, without further ado, we have Anna Paula Gomez with Pie Test Picked. So, uh, hi, everyone. My name is Anna. And uh, today I will talk about, with you about PyTest Picket. So basically, I have two goals in this lightning talk. The first one is make you understand me, so it can be quite challenging. And the second one is get you to know about PyTest Picket. Uh, according with one of my coworkers, uh, even if this, this presentation goes wrong, uh, maybe you like the, this small plugin that I developed during the last weekend. So, uh, let's say uh, that you, you were asked for developer a new feature. So, basically, you wrote the test and then you changed a few files. And you are ready for your first commit for this feature. So, basically, we have uh, a bunch of files modified so, and a few tests to run before commit. So after all, you don't want to execute all the tests available in your code test. Just hypothetically speaking, maybe you have some code base that will take a few hours to, to run all the tests. So basically, you decide to run the tests related to the, the modified files. So then you decide to use PyTest for, for it. So then you copy and paste the, the name of the files. And then you go through this process, um, executing git status and then copying the name of the, the module and then pytest, pasting stuff and then repeating over and over again. So I don't like to do repetitive work, do you? Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to introduce you, pytest picket. So I was expecting someone to, yeah, that's it. <laughs> So basically here uh, is a small demonstration of five seconds. So basically let's say uh, we changed a few tests and probably we will execute the git status just to check the name of the test. In this project I have two test modules. Basically I execute pytest, uh, pick it, and then it will filter uh, just the test related to the changed files the tests that weren't committed yet. So here you can say the test files that, that weren't committed before. So uh, PyTest collected 33 t items, I mean tests, but just one module was executed. So basically uh, that is a small plugin, but looking for the future, I, I'm planning to execute tests related to the branch. So instead of executing the tests that were changed, uh, would be nice to execute all the, the tests modified in a branch. And also to get the test from a specific module that maybe you changed but didn't add any tests for it. So uh, the plugin, of course, is open source. 
and I'm looking forward to hear your ideas and feedback about it. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anna. So who's next? So right, well, Harry will be next. Harry? Yes. Harry, yes. Harry. So Harry, come on out and get set up. Come on, Harry. Yay. So are we, are we storytelling or are we game playing in the in interim? Um, well, who wants another story? Stories are good. Who wants a game? <laughs> yeah, games. I win. <laughs> Just kidding. Okay, so story time. That was a <laughs> okay. Never have I ever deleted a production database. Yeah, there we go. Those are the real errors. Yeah, those are the most fun. Those are really good days, aren't they? Yeah. Um, never have I ever. And some of these, by the way, are taken from some of the talks that I've seen this week, so they should sound familiar. So I. Are they for from some mine? Of them, sorry. Are they from mine? Guess we'll have to find out. I don't know. Um, so, never have I ever run a very important and crucial command in the very exact wrong environment. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that one's fun too. Lacey, um, Lacey. Oh, are we ready? Yeah, there's a tree. Oh my goodness. Okay. Well, I'm going to stop playing this game now and I'm going to introduce you to Harry, who's going to teach us all how to build a treehouse. Hello. Cool. Hey, everyone. Uh, welcome to my talk about tree houses, which is moving on automatically. Whoa. Stop, 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 stop. Start again. Uh. Okay, cool. Yeah, uh, so I think this is a fitting uh, image to start with. Uh, there's something really kind of childlike about being in a tree house. It has a kind of fun and uh, kind of escapism to being in a tree house with your dog. Um, on the other end of the spectrum, we have a slide which won't go on. Ugh. No. I'm just going to do it like this. Uh, so the other end of the spectrum, uh, we have something like this. This is uh, Horace's Cathedral in Tennessee. It was built by one man uh, over a period of something like 15 years. It's 10 stories high and uh, 30 meters high. Uh, in uh, 2012, it was shut down to, due to fire, um, fire regulations. This is another really big favorite of mine. Uh, it's a hotel called the Woodpecker Hotel in Sweden. And I really love it because it's basically just a house that you've just plunked in a tree. You can stay here uh, as a guest. Um, you have to access it by a rope and uh, you're fed food via the rope. I don't know if you're allowed to leave during the stay, um, but that's a really cool one. Um, this is uh, on one of the crazier ends of the spectrum. Uh, this is a tree house called Sam's Tree House. Um, and the guy built the house and then thought, hey, one day he thought, what, what, I, what this house really needs is a plane. Uh, so he stuck a plane in the side uh, and there's a boat on the other side and uh, around on the right there's a a, uh, some kind of Apache helicopter as well, and the picture here of the dog, uh, you can see. Um, and then this treehouse wins the award for the most inventive way to access the treehouse. Uh, you just get on the bike, pedal, and up you go. Um, I could show you pictures of beautiful treehouses, and there are a lot. I could show you them all day, but I wanted to give you some practical trips, uh, ticks, uh, trips on building a treehouse. Uh, when you think about building a treehouse, uh, the thing you might think of doing first is getting a bunch of pieces of wood, getting lots of little nails and hammering them in. This is a really bad idea because uh, the tree actually lives in a layer underneath the bark. So if you hammer in loads of little tiny nails, what can happen is the tree gets um, a kind of compartment syndrome, like you get in muscles and it can die. Um, another bad idea is to think, hey, I can get away with, that, with making it no holes whatsoever um, just by having some kind of a collar or some kind of cladding. This is even worse uh, because uh, it makes a bigger cut in the bark uh, and can completely cut off all the nutrients to the top of the tree. Uh, so if you want a happy tree and you want your treehouse to last, uh, the best thing to do is to take advantage of uh, this modern invention, uh, which is called the Garnier Limb. It was invented in the World Treehouse Conf Conference, which I've always wanted to go to, in 1997. Um, and it's basically a huge bolt. Uh, you, you put one in, uh, and it looks kind of destructive, but the actual hole you're making in the tree is only a small circle. Most of it's living inside the dead heartwood. And that piece of hardware can hold like three and a half metric tons. It's, it's really, really crazy. Um, the tree uh, you're building on is, is a living thing, so you've got to take account of a few pieces of movement. The first uh, thing you have to take account of is growth. Um, a lot of people will think, I'll put my, my bolt in here and over time it'll move. But actually the bolt stays exactly where it is because a tree grows from the tips of the branches um, and it grows outwards in layers. So all that happens really is that your bolt gets kind of enveloped by the bark. So if you're building a tree house, make sure that your beam is paced, uh, spaced away from the bark. 
the tree also moves in the wind. It acts as a kind of lever. Uh, so when the wind uh, is on the top, the amount of force on the base is absolutely huge and can rip a tree house in two. Uh, so what people do here uh, on the left is called a tree house attachment bolt. Uh, allows the, uh, the, the bolt to, to slide up, up and down. Or, or you can use cables. If you use too many cables, then you end up with a tree swing, not a tree house. Um, but uh, normally what you do is you attach, uh, you fix yourself to one of the trees, and then when the other trees sway, um, your tree house is safe. Cool, thank you for my talk. This is a picture of me in my tree house. It's more of a tree platform, but hopefully one day I'll be living in a big house with walls. Um, and uh, if you want to uh, be inspired or know more about trees and climbing trees, I can recommend this book, uh, The Man Who Climbs Trees uh, by James Aldred. It's just a really awesome collection of stories of climbing in rainforests and all that kind of stuff. Uh, great, thank you very much. <laughs>
to use JavaScript to choose. We write some uh, deep, K, deep K K snake case transformations. So when the, da the data comes, we transform it to camel case, and when we post something to the back end, we transform it to snake case. Which is kind of bad because uh, if you want to, the, actually the JavaScript knows that you, the JavaScript expects, expects uh, the back end to return it a snake case, which uh, the language does, doesn't like it. Uh, second thing I did is that when I become a little bit uh, better in React, I uh, actually in the Redux, the, it's Redux middleware. So Redux schema has middleware in it, like the Django ones, but not that good. Uh, we moved the get and post uh, transformations to the middleware, so it kind of happened uh, in the back of the developer calling, but you know, as I told you, it wasn't that good as Django, so it, <laughs> it was a lot of bugs with it, so we decided to remove it. Um, yeah, it kind of worked, but I still didn't like it, so the next thing I found is that Django Rest has renders and parses, you, and you can write your own custom one. So that's the last thing we have. Uh, now the logic that uh, transforms camel case to snake case and vice versa is in the back end. This is how a custom camel case renderer look. You just uh, inherit from the JSON renderer from the renders and just really? <laughs> Sorry. Thank you so much. Five minutes goes by really, really fast. I definitely understand that. Um, next, we will have Shai, who's going to talk to us about Git menorahs and why they're harmful. And while Shai gets set up, so Kemet the Frog goes. Ah, uh, whoa, hello. There we go. So, so Kemet the Frog goes into a bank. He and Piggy, they want to start a patisserie. They want to start making stroopwafel. And he goes up to the teller, and the teller goes, "Hello, good morning. I'm Patricia. I want to help you with your thing. What can I help you with today?" And so Kemet goes, "Well, I want a loan." And Patricia's like, oh, okay, well, let's get you set up. Um, how did you know about our bank? Oh, yeah, my, my godfather, uh, you know, the, uh, you, you may have heard of him, he's a bit famous, uh, you know, Mick Jagger. Oh, I love him. Oh, he's so wonderful. Okay, we'll get you all set up and stuff. And, and Kermit's like sitting there and, and Patricia's just saying, okay, well, we're going to need some collateral for your loan. And so Kermit gets his rucksack and rustles it around and then puts up this little tiny ceramic unicorn onto the counter. And Patricia goes, hmm, okay, um, one second, let me go get the manager. Are we set up? Yes, no? Great, well, I'm gonna continue that story after this wonderful talk about Git Menorahs. Hello, I'm Shai. Um, I've taken uh, Lacey's advice, thank you, from yesterday and uh, picked a subject where I have a strong opinion. So um, what I'm going to talk about here is my opinion. It's not really a consensus. Uh, but um, yeah, your mileage may vary. Uh, and um, this is the menorah. Um, you might be wondering what Git menorahs are. Uh, but first I'm going to talk about actual menorahs. Um, actually, there's two kinds of menorahs. This is a bit of Jewish trivia. Um, there's um, the temple menorah with seven branches, which used to be in the temple when it existed in Jerusalem 2,000 years ago. But uh, this is not something that we use today in Jewish practice. And there's the nine-branch menorah, or the Hanukkah menorah, um, which we use every year in the holiday of Hanukkah. And um, actually, that's, this is the um, terminology of the English-speaking Jewish world. And in Israel, we call the, uh, the seven-branch menorah menorah and the uh, nine-branch menorah Hanukkah for Hanukkah. Um, but anyway, these are the non-Git menorahs. And this is the Git menorah. Um, yeah, I, I uh, assume this means that you, this is clear enough. 
Um, the, this is the, the um, repository of a project I was involved with, uh, anonymized to protect the innocent and guilty. Um, and basically, um, some of you might be wondering uh, what is wrong in this picture. So um, to answer this question, we first need to go through something more basic. Um, and that is, what do we use version control for at all? And um, I think that we use it for two uh, main goals. One is to coordinate co collaborative work so that we can work together on a common code base without stepping on each other's feet. And the other is to keep a record of history. But then this begs the question, why do we need the history? And there, uh, again, this is my opinion, there's uh, two main issues. Um, not two, sorry. There's, well, basically, we need the history to fix mistakes. We need to find when something broke so we can fix it. And we need to uh, sometimes reconsider decisions because the conditions or requirements have changed. And sometimes some change was simply wrong and, and we need to revert it. Um, another thing we uh, should uh, consider when thinking about why we need the history is what we don't need in the history. And that is the exact details of work being done. So um, we don't need all the typo and typo corrections. We don't need the, I fixed the Y space because of review comments, all that is, is really noise and not interesting history. So now we can answer the question, what is wrong with this picture? Well, for one thing, Git bisect gets severely limited when you have this um, picture. Um, and reverting a merge commit just is, is pure damage. It undoes the individual commits in non-obvious ways. It's, hard to find out exactly why the thing you committed and pushed like weeks ago suddenly isn't there. And um, usually when you see something like this, it means someone just worked on a branch and finished the work and just pushed it and uh, without uh, any consideration. So in summary, uh, if there's one thing you're taking from this talk, uh, this is what I want you to take. Code history should be kept in a way which serves the project going forward and not to serve pure academic historical research, not code archaeology. So um, use Git rebase to reshape the history of your work before pushing. And uh, follow the example of the Django repository, which looks like this. And that's all I have today. Thank you. Very, very perfect timing, too. Thank you, Shai. All right, our next speaker is going to be Ducky. She's going to talk about um, taking five minutes for your mental health. Um, while she gets set up, I do have, or Ducky, do you have anything to set up? Oh, uh, Ducky, can't I finish my story? Ooh. If you insist. If, if I insist, okay. So Kevin's just put up this little ceramic unicorn onto the counter and, and Patricia's just going, well, what is that? So Kermit, <clears throat> Excuse me, what was your name? Oh, my name is Ms. Wack. Ms. Wack, can you please go get your manager? So the manager comes out and goes, okay, what's the problem? And Kermit goes there with his Kermit voice that I can't do and says, excuse me, I would like a loan. And Patricia just goes, no, no, he, he has only this little ceramic thing for collateral. What am I supposed to do? And the manager knows who Kermit is. Everyone knows who Kermit is. And so he just quietly pulls Patricia aside and goes, it's a knick-knack. Paddywhack, give the frog a loan. His old man's a rolling stone. <laughs> and now Ducky, who's less terrible than me. Hello. Oh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Ducky. I'm going to stand over here because I'm short. Um, how are you all doing? This is an interactive talk, so please actually like speak back. Uh, I hope you're all doing well, maybe. Yeah, yeah. yeah? Anyone feeling a bit tired? Like this week has just, no, no? Wow, you have way more energy than I do. I am really ready to nap. And this talk is definitely not an excuse 
to do that at all. But you know, while we're here, you know what's really important for your mental health? Sleep. Sleep is really important for you. So I'm gonna get to that in a second. Uh, but first, uh, exercise also really important for your mental and physical well-being. So uh, thank you to the organizers uh, of JagoCon for bringing out those uh, excellent people teaching us how to do exercises at our desk. That was really awesome. Um, also, I'm gonna try and slow down a bit uh, for the stenographers because I'm Australian and apparently we're very good at speaking fast. I've known Russell for a little while now. <laughs> um, and on, on Russell and him talking about time, I'm gonna try and slow down, not time itself, I'm not that cool yet, uh, but we're gonna try and slow down your perception of time. Uh, so I'm just gonna run us through a few kind of body scans. Uh, these are just kind of little exercises you can do if you're, you're feeling a lot of feelings or if you're not feeling anything at all. And you can just kind of run through your body and feel your feelings, as weird as that sounds. Just kind of be with yourself. And so if you're feeling angry, you're just kind of like, oh, hey there, anger. What up? You're just, you're just doing your thing. If you're feeling stressed or anxious, you can just kind of visualize that and feel it inside you rather than fighting it which will only make you more anxious um, so I'm gonna get you all hopefully this doesn't make you feel uncomfortable but uh, if it does feel free to opt out it's okay I'm not gonna force you but uh, I'd love you all if you could to close your eyes and now just take some deep and slow breaths in and out in and out. Now I want you to take your mind to your extremities, your fingertips or your toes, doesn't matter which. Just feel the ends of your body. You might be able to feel them touching the floor or just feel the air around them. Now explore further up, either your hands or your feet. Very slowly, just feeling your feet on the ground or your hands in your lap. And then just slowly bring that up through your arms or through your legs, up into your body. Still breathing. In out. Now, you might be able to, like, if you're having any emotions at the moment, I hear that's a common thing people do, uh, you might be able to visualize kind of what sort of shape that feeling is. It might have a color or a texture. Just kind of explore it, be with it. Now I want you to explore back down very slowly through your arms or legs, maybe even shake it up and go to the other limbs. Now back to your extremities and you can open your eyes. So that is a very quick demonstration of what a body scan is. Um, and you can do these as many times as you like any way you want, like some people like to start at their head, go to their feet, some people like to go up and down, it's, it's up to you. Uh, it's a really good thing to just practice every day for like however much time you feel like you want to spend on it. And if the more you practice it, the more kind of you can be with your feelings and yourself. Uh, I don't have time, but I really wanted to play a game with you called Sleeping Ponies. Maybe we can catch up later and we can play that. Or you can play it for five seconds where you all close your eyes really fast and just fall asleep. <laughs> and then you wake up at the gong. <laughs> I feel so relaxed now. Sleeping Ponies is the best game. Yeah. So next we'll have Ilya talking with, to us about metaprogramming. But while Ilya gets set up, I wonder, Katie, do you have any Never Have I Evers? I have a Never Have I Ever. Never Have I Ever 
forgotten to rerun migrations? Yeah. Yes. Ooh, I have one. Ooh. Never have I ever written a custom migration that just totally did not work and screwed everything up. Never have I ever tried to run make migrations on an older version of Django and wondered why it didn't work because I was running it when South was a thing before make migrations was a thing and I'm wondering what's wrong and ah. Oh, those were the days, weren't they? Thank you, Andrew. All right, I think we're ready to go. <laughs> Woo, go. So hi, my name is Ilya and I want to show you the meta programming system. Who of you heard of the meta programming system? Yeah, a few hands up. I'm pretty sure that you heard of the company which builds this system, JetBrains. And JetBrains is building cool stuff, right? So what is MPS? MPS is a language workbench, so you can create new languages, domain-specific languages or new programming languages, and it has a projective editor. So what is a projective editor? A projective editor is something different than the traditional editor. So the traditional editor, you have a file, your Python file, it's a text file, it's stored in a file system. If you open this file, it gets parsed and converted to an abstract syntax tree, so a tree representation. If you edit this file, this tree is regenerated. This tree is needed for code completion, for syntax highlighting, and so on. A projectional editor, uh, takes this abstract syntax tree as the core element, as a single source of truth, and stores it on the file system. And what you can do now is define multiple editors, which uh, can be used for editing this tree, so these are projections. And I want to show this in a demo. So, I hope it's not, not too small. It's a pro uh, oh. <laughs> Okay, I hope you see it. Um, so this is uh, a Java-based programming language, a support for MPS, and we are at the DiangoCon, right? So I want to show you what, what it means to have a projection, not a real text. So I can say here, I'm a Python developer, please remove all the braces, and the left code will be converted in a more Pythonic representation. And it's still working, so if I go here, and say I want to return something else like example.2. pattern. It's still working. And the cool thing is that now I don't like this name of this class. And I can rename the class without using a re uh, rename refactoring because I'm actually referencing a node in the AC. It's not text anymore. So I can type something like configuration helper provider impl, so it looks more like Java, right? <laughs> and you see all references are uh, renamed on the fly. Uh, in the top of the code, we have this new keyword. Maybe you knew it from Java, and I don't like this. I forgot to remove it. And down here, we have the editor component for this statement. And it's just a templating language, so I can just remove, remove this new, uh, new, new keyword. And if I find the button, rebuild the project, and it's gone. So and we can look at the generated uh, source code. So we like generate Java code out of it, and you see it on the right. So it's still normal Java. So what I can do with this? Actually, I can use uh, formulas in my code and edit these formulas. I can use diagrams and edit these diagrams, and it will be actual valid code. I can put date pickers into my code and maybe a selection for time zones. Or I can represent diagrams and do calculation, live calculation, like you maybe know from Xcode Playground. So it's quite a nice tool. Download it, try it out. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. That was cool. We only have one more. Yes, this is our last one. Raphael is going to talk to us about saving ponies by reducing the resource consumption of our Django servers. Oh, a Django talk. That seems relevant. It does. It does. One more never have I ever. Never have I ever accidentally CC'd instead of, instead of BCC'd more than 100 people. <laughs> a few of you, all right. I think, I think maybe more of you are lying. Never have I ever used the wrong emoji. 
Oh, gosh. There you go. All right, Raphael, take it away. <laughs> Hello. So I'll try to speak a bit slower than uh, my previous talk at Jankukon. Some people still remember it, I'm sorry. Um, I'm going to be talking about, uh, about how to, you could reduce the resource consumptions of your Django project. Um, so why would you be interested in that? Um, so that's, that came from me for our problem in the office. So we are running a car sharing system in Paris. And well, it's, it's a bit big, that project. It's, it's now seven years old. We have 300 models. So uh, manage.py run server takes 12 seconds to complete before accepting any request. And we thought, yeah, it's not that good. So we had some, some benchmark. So default setting with micro WSG said, yeah, startup 13 seconds, memory consumption 900 megabytes on our production servers. And when the first query arrives, we still need 3.7 seconds to answer Q, Q -O -O, OK, just an empty response on our uh, warm up test uh, endpoint. Not very good. Why? Why does it happen? How does Django and MicroWSGI work together? Well, first, MicroWSGI starts in its default configuration and it prepares its uh, worker processes, and then it starts accepting requests from your load balancer. When the first request arrives, the uh, worker process actually starts, loads an, an event, loads your WSGI.py uh, file which loads Django, Django handles the requests. Then you handle more requests, and at some point, your worker dies because too many requests handled, or too much memory consumption, or whichever settings you have decided to set. It is recycled, and we go back to uh, step two. Um, and an important thing is the default uh, microwisgi configuration. It starts in what is called lazy mode. What does it mean? It it will load your uh, wizgi.py file in each uh, worker process instead of the master. It does make sense on a custom local uh, deployment where you have lots of small applications, not much load, and so it avoids over uh, consuming resources for uh, requests that might not come. You might get one or two requests per hour. Well, in production, it's not going to happen. So I set out an experiment and I decided to disable it. What happened? Well. Wow, start of time, uh, yeah, not that good. We saved a bit of memory, not much, but the first query handled by our worker went much, cl much sooner. Why is that? Well, the main difference is um, that now microwisgi will load WS, your wisgi.py file first thing, then Fox its uh, processes, then the worker loads Django, and once that worker is said ready, MicroWSGI accepts the requests. So we've moved some of our loading time in the master MicroWSGI uh, loading time instead of the worker. And since we recycle worker in our uh, standard process life cycle, we save time on every uh, loading of our requests. But it didn't feel good enough. So we decided to make a small change and to actually load the whole Django code base before forking processes. I'll explain why afterwards. So basically, we just changed our uh, get with the application and called a small function we defined which says warm up Django. And it, what it does is basically create a fake request and just executes it in Django's uh, standard system. Small tip, we have to close connections afterwards because here we are not exactly firing the proper Django signals. It was a bit of a hack. So, yeah. And what we went on, okay, so global startup time, nine seconds, memory usage way lower, and first query, same time appro approximately. Why, why this change? Well, basically, um, here at step two, we now load the whole WSGI application, which means that all the Django code, all your models, in memory presentation, your URL conf, everything required to handle your query requests is loaded before the processes are, are forked, and thus memory is shared between your master process and each child, even for recycled uh, workers. So you consume suddenly much less memory, 
and your uh, infrastructure team is very happy. That's it. Think of the ponies.